Hey everyone, thanks for coming to my late evening talk on uh, applications of transient storage. Uh, my name is Moody. Uh, I'm an advisor at Uniswap Labs. Um, just quick intro: worked at Uniswap for two years, developed Uniswap v3, and now I'm an advisor. Always up for Smash Bros, so come find me um, or table tennis. Um, and so my goal with this talk is just to convince everyone that transient storage is more than just a gas optimization. Um, so transient storage is a, is a sort of a different way of using storage, and so let's get into that. Um, first, with a background, what it is and how it's used today, and then we're going to go through a little story of building a marketplace protocol um, just to get an idea of like how this helps you improve the protocols you're building. Um, so, so first, first things first is uh, you probably already do use transient storage, and uh, really it's just when you're using a storage slot uh, by writing a non-zero value and then writing it back to zero before the end of the transaction. Um, so the most common use case is reentrancy locks, and oftentimes you'll see a modifier uh, lock which does locked equals true underscore locked equals false. Um, and that's the most common use case, and most people already use it. We use it as well for uh, constructing units, swap pools. Others use it for outbox, um, like uh, uh, L2 rollups, like arbitrage that. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of use cases in the ecosystem today. And the reason it's, uh, it has a special uh, classification is because uh, when you do this zero to non-zero to zero rate, um, you actually get an, a, a refund from the EVM, a gas refund. Um, so let's get into the usages. Um, the first one I talked about, reentrancy locks, look like this. Uh, what they do is prevent reentrancy, which is uh, which causes a huge uh, fraction of uh, all smart contract vulnerabilities. So you've probably already seen this. Um, so this prevents reentrance. Another usage which we use is a little more uh, esoteric. Most people don't use it. Uh, we use it to basically make the code hash of a Uniswap pool a constant, which makes it cheaper to compute the address of a pool on chain, uh, significantly cheaper. Um, and so, you know, the deployer will set some parameters for the constructor arguments. We'll deploy the pool, and then we'll delete those parameters from storage. Uh, and so, that's an example of a transient storage use. Um, here's another usage, not at Uniswap, it's the Arbitrum outbox. Um, so what they'll do is, when they're executing a transaction sent from L2 to L1, they'll put the context of the L2 transaction in storage, call, make the uh, L2 to L1 call, and then they'll uh, delete this from storage. And so this surfaces the L2 context uh, to the uh, L1 transaction without making any assumptions on uh, the interface of of the contract that's being called. So the transient storage is already in the EVM, so why do we need an EIP? What's, what's the difference? Um, so there's some issues with the current approach, and the biggest one, the most recent one, is that uh, refunds are now capped as of the London hard fork to 20% uh, of all the gas used in a transaction. Um, so if you, if you uh, go over that cap for a refund, you basically pay 20k gas for something that's not ever writing to storage. Um, and it's really just 32 bytes of memory, so that's way, way more expensive than um, than actual M store and M load. Um, and the, the context for that is gas token, getting rid of gas token, and block size ability. Um, so there, there are good reasons for doing that. Um, also, storage refunds are not given on revert. So if you write a slot, uh, and then you write it back to zero, and then you revert, you don't even get the refund. So there's there's a lot of gas wasted there, uh, which never writes to disk. Um, and a really important distinction is that uh, with regular storage, you can't avoid reading the original zero value from disk. Um, so uh, even though in your contract, you know that locked is always false when someone enters your contract, um, and always false when they successfully exit or revert, um, you, the node still has to read from the, from the tree to get the value zero. Um, so it's, it's a wasted S load and wasted reads always. 
Um, and probably the most um, important one is that uh, the storage and underemphasized uh, the storage refund logic is uh, really complicated. And I was actually working on a slide to like uh, describe exactly how much gas an S store would cost. And I had to go through like four different EIPs which refer to each other, and I couldn't even figure it out. Um, so I ended up discarding that slide. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really hard for a developer if you show them a piece of code to understand uh, how much gas a particular piece of code will cost if it touches storage. So that's where EIP 1153 comes in. It brings two new opcodes. Uh, one of them is T load, the other is T store. They're, they behave exactly the same as S load and S store, um, except they only persist within a single transaction. Um, and so because of that, they never have to read from disk and they never have to write to disk, uh, which are the most expensive operations for a node. Um, and so they can be priced much cheaper. Uh, but they do have to be a little bit more expensive than memory because uh, they still have to revert just like S store and S load deal with reverts. Um, yeah, so here's a, here's a visualization from the Ethereum Magicians thread uh, by Pascal. Um, and the important thing to gather from this is that transient storage is a lot more like machine state uh, than like persistent storage. And yeah, another way to think of it is it's, it's like a transaction persistent memory region for, for contracts. Um, and so going back to those previous use cases, um, they're all just way cheaper now. You don't have to read uh, the original value from uh, storage. And, uh, and it's also just, you, you don't have to deal with refunds. So you don't have to worry about how much gas uh, the transaction is spending, whether you're gonna get the full refund, uh, which you often wouldn't with, in the case of uh, Uniswap v2. And so we actually did a little trick here where instead of doing zero, uh, one, zero writes, we did one, zero, one writes. Um, and that's because the refund for doing that is a little bit smaller, but the drawback is now you're just wasting uh, 32 bytes uh, on every pool for no reason. Um, and plus you're wasting all those reads. Um, so yeah, that's, that's sort of the background, but uh, I wanna make the argument that uh, you know, uh, it doesn't just improve uh, these existing use cases. It, uh, it, because it's so much cheaper and so much more accessible, you can, you can create uh, smart contracts with uh, new patterns. Um, and we're gonna go through that with this next story. So let's say, let's say we're uh, designing a marketplace contract. Uh, customers can buy items for fixed prices. Customers can sell items for fixed prices. Um, and so you can imagine it's something like Seaport, uh, but maybe just like fixed prices on every NFT. Um, so version one might look something like this. Uh, you have a function on the contract called buy, a function on the contract called sell. And when you call buy, you receive the item and you have to send the payment for item one. When you call buy, you have to do the same thing again. And when you call sell, you transfer the item and receive payment. Um, and so this is a little naive because you're doing extra calls, extra transfers. Um, it doesn't work very, it, it's just more expensive than it needs to be. So you might want to do something like uh, batching all your buys and then batching all your sells. Um, and so you might, you know, refactor and make it look like this, where you allow the user to specify multiple items they want to buy and then they only have to send the net payment and then multiple items they want to sell um, and receive net payment. Um, but let's say like the user wants to buy item one and two and then sell item three to partly pay for it. Um, this doesn't work very well for that because they have to put up front all the money for buy or, or call sell before buy. Uh, so it imposes some restrictions. Um, so what you do is you design this new method, execute orders, uh, which takes some list of like arbitrary operations with their own arguments buy one, buy two, sell three, sell four. Uh, and so uh, within this method, you only have to deal with the net uh, amount that you have to pay or that you're being paid. Um, and so this works, but what if uh, pricing is dynamic? Um, or like what if the user has to respond to the price they get when they buy two 
or they want to sell three and then only sell four uh, if the result of some contract call is true. Um, or like if they don't have enough to buy one and two by only selling three. So, so like the user will want to impose like their own logic in between these contract calls and so that makes this a little bit uh, uh, difficult to work with. Um, and there are ways you can solve this by adding different kind of operations. Let's say in between your buy and sell, you have another call to another contract um, to, to do some additional logic or conditional sales. Um, but you're getting into more and more complex designs, which are very hard to work with. And you're going to have to deal with encoding this uh, very complex order on chain and off chain. Um, so you, when we think about these uh, types of orders, is there they're sort of like opcodes with different arguments. Um, and you're kind of designing, you're designing a virtual machine, which is your protocol, um, with these like buy opcodes, sell opcodes, you know, conditional sell, et cetera. And it's like, it's really hard to design a perfect VM, which is the whole reason we have EIPs. Um, so yeah, instead of, instead of trying to design the perfect uh, execute order function, uh, there's this alternate design where you enforce contract level invariants. Um, so uh, you can call into this lock function, the customer will get a call back, and you can do the buys and sells. You can do anything you want within the context of the EVM. You can call arbitrary contracts. Um, and then at the end, all you have to do is pay uh, the differences and transfer the items that you owe the contract. And the way the contract remembers in between these different calls uh, how much you owe it is the buys and sells, and then it checks the, the invariance and transient storage at the end. Um, so this, this allows the user the full freedom of the EVM to do any actions they want uh, within the context of the lock, as long as they uh, meet the invariance of the marketplace. Um, so here's an easy way to think about talking about it. You can call it the till pattern. Um, it acts sort of as a cash register, so it's like a till. Uh, you check the total value in the till. Um, and you can also think of it you can remember it because you're deferring all the validation till the end. So it's kind of like until the user is done interacting with your contracts. Um, and yeah, here's the current state of it. Uh, it's being implemented by Uniswap Labs mostly, uh, but they're working with contractors. Uh, Mark Tynway kicked it off with, uh, he's from Optimism. Eddie Denver at a hackathon, he started the Ethereum JS VM. Death is completed fork, never mind in progress. So, so we're making a lot of progress towards it. Hari, call out to Hari. Today, you just implemented the uh, assembly opcodes in Solidity. Um, and you can test against it today if you just use a particular hard hat uh, package version. Um, so yeah, please add your uh, use cases to the thread, and I uh, hear some additional links. Any questions? Uh, yes, uh, if there's any question, don't hesitate to ask. No question? Is there any current estimated timeline? Yeah, so uh, it's definitely not going with the merge, obviously. Um, Shanghai, I think, probably will be uh, maybe early mid next year. I don't know if anyone really knows, uh, but um, but like we're trying to get it to be CFI for Shanghai, but there's a, a little bit of pushback just because of priorities. Um, so mid next year. <laughs> Servers and storage and more expensive than memory. Do you have any number on the gas cost of these opcodes? Yeah, so right now it's priced at 100 gas, and we did some, uh, both of them are 100 gas each, and we did some testing uh, with Infura uh, to make sure that it didn't pose a threat to DOSing uh, any of the clients. Um, caveat, it crossed remix, so I don't know. <laughs> It, it, it may not be, it may be a little too cheap right now, but we haven't gotten to final numbers. Any more questions? Okay, so. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>